American people because of our history of oppression and distortion and, 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 and miseducation have to ask the question, what is our reason for being in the world? It's found in divine law. The African divine law, and you can look at various African uh, uh, philosophies, but they all uh, translate to the same thing. The African divine law says that the, the divine law is simply to be, that humans be, and that in being we are the creative cause which makes us divine. Now that sounds sort of philosophical, but maybe, maybe even uh, doesn't make sense to some folk. But what it essentially says is that, that if you don't be, it don't be. That if you don't be, nothing else occurs. And so in the being, you have a responsibility to determine what happens to you. We can't be passive uh, victims of whatever happens to us and say, oh, someone did this to me and I'm, that's why I'm in this condition. Oh, I didn't get this, that's why I'm failing in this condition. Now the African way says that because since we be, then we are the creative cause of our condition. The only time we accept conditions that are less good for us is when we think that other folk are the creative cause. No, the African way says we are the creative cause. And in, and in, in, and in divine law, it is determined that every divine law has a moral mandate, and the moral mandate for African people is that if you be, you must become more better. You must become more better. That it is being more better that determines our process. If you look at what we do and how we do it as African people, all the things that we've done have always been challenged by this desire to be more better. The way your mama raised you, the way your grandfather raised you, the way your folk related to black children was really about being more better, that you can do more better than what you've done, that you don't have to accept this relationship. I mean, the fact that we went through 400 years of, of, of physical bondage and came out being able to establish universities. I mean, just think about that one fact, that, that black people were in bondage for 400 years, made illegal and sometimes even killed when we attempted to learn to read. And then as soon as we had physical emancipation, the three things that we created or recreated was the family. We, men and women walked all over this country trying to find their wife, their child, their mama, their brother, to recreate family. We created, we recreated the school, and we recreated the church. The church, the school, the family are the three pillars that we felt institutionally were important for us to be more better. That we didn't have those three things, theology, education, and family, we couldn't be more better. And so we, were, and, and that was a miracle in itself. How could people who were, were destroyed, who were killed, who were brutalized, who were taught that they were, we were less than human, that we were in fact animals, immediately invent historical black colleges, begin to talk about education, and begin to develop men and women who were scientists, and who were philosophers, and who were architects, and, and, and who were doctors, and who were, who were, were, were minds that were, were, were so brilliant in terms of the, the legal area that everyone else in the United States follows our legal prescriptions relative to issues of freedom and liberty in this country. We couldn't do that if we didn't have a moral mandate that spoke to the issue of being more better, the issue of becoming more better. And what we see in this theology and in this development of, of the next generation is that every cycle of major religious pronouncement is really a refinement. It is not Christians uh, are right and the Muslims are wrong, or the Muslims are right and the Jews are wrong, or, or the, the Orthodox Western religions are right and the traditional African religions are wrong. It isn't that at all. Our tradition has always been to refine based upon where we are. And you see this in ancient Kemetic studies, that, that the, the theology of the, of the first conceptions of, of, of the God force that happened in ancient Memphis talked about the creative principle being the unification. That, that the creative cause unifies things, doesn't divide them, doesn't separate them, doesn't destroy them, and that in fact in Aha Minis, a black man stands up and because of the theology begins to unify the north and south uh, uh, regions of ancient Egypt. So you see it's the, the political educational practice was consistent with the theological understanding of who we are. 
That's why you have the, the, the Presbyterian Church of old seeing that it's not just praying to God and going on to heaven, but we must do something in our here and now in order to make a difference so that our children will be more better. You see later in, in ancient Kemet in the city of Heliopolis, the same principle of God force translates now to not unification, but self-generation. That every people, every community has a responsibility to regenerate itself. What that means in very practical terms is that as we look at the next generation, these young people here in this, in, 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 in this, ch in this chapel, we have to ask, are we engaging in a process that reproduces and refines them as a representative of who we are. That our children should not grow up looking in the mirror and hating what they see. Our children should not grow up believing that they need to cut off their noses and cut their lips off. And even though they're, they're highly talented and, and the world sees them as a, a musical genius, uh, think they have to distort their physical features in order to be accepted by the world. We're not reproducing, refining the best of ourselves when our children think that they need to be, look like, act like, walk like, talk like, be like someone else. We have to see these things as, as part of the process. Uh, Self-generation and Hermophilus, Still, you know, thousands of years later, uh, Africans begin to talk about the creative principle, that creative cause being the, the principle of unicity. Again, that we are unified. That explains why in our traditions, uh, the movements of, of African people from uh, Marcus Garvey's UNIA to the, to the, to the NAACPA to the, 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 uh, the, the Urban League to uh, all the movements, civil, uh, quote, civil rights movements of this country weren't talking about just getting some material piece of the pie. They were talking about how aberrant, how vulgar it is when one people separate themselves and try to segregate another group of people based upon uh, their race or their color. That that was abhorrent to us, that that was, that was vulgar to us, and that, that we should fight and, and, and rally against that. It was driven by the same principles, self-generation, uh, unification, unicity. So we have a long history of principles that really reflect our behavior and that we can then go back and take and talk about how do we use these same principles to reproduce and refine the next generation of our, of our community. And those are our children. That then suggests that our youth development programs, our manhood training programs, our womanhood training programs have to be centered in our culture. We cannot go and find Dr. Spock's book and read on page 13 how, what it is to do to, to provide discipline in our children. Dr. Spock didn't know anything about African people, and he knew really very little about European people, but, but, but he becomes a, a, a line that we look for. We can't go and look and find uh, Child Development 101 at the local community college or the, or, or, the, or, the, or the major university, depending on what, and go and study that and get certified and say, how ah, now I can go out and teach young people. In fact, the matter is that our children reject all those pronouncements about who we are because instinctually they know, as we really know, that that's not about us, it's not centered in us. It has to be African-centered uh, if it's going to be a model of development. And that's a very formal process. It's not just, let's go out and put on some African clothes and get some drums, start playing some drums and maybe burn some candles and ring some bells and we call it Afrocentric. It's not that, it's more, it's more complex and more important than those kinds of things. Afrocentric youth development really talks about crafting, and this is where we have to come together as, as a community, of crafting uh, the systematic process where we develop and stimulate certain kinds of knowledge in our young people, certain kinds of skills in our young people, certain abilities, attitudes, and character in our young people that are necessary for them to have in order to not only survive wherever they find themselves, but to meet the future. And in meeting the future, be able to master that future. Our process of development has to be socially defined, goal-oriented, and designed specifically so that our young people are able to achieve mastery of all and every aspect of human functioning. We can't say we've done a good job if we got brothers who know that when you talk about basketball, that's the black man's thing, that we have failed if we, can, if we take pride just in the fact that brothers mastered the basketball. Clearly we should master the basketball because that's something that's part of human functioning. But we should see our developmental process as really a process where we achieve mastery of all and every aspect of human functioning. Uh, the brother uh, uh, McNair who was the astronaut, we didn't know, our children didn't know that here's this black man who was an astronaut flying off into space until he met the tragic day of his death. 
what they, what, what we should not see and, t and pinpoint him as something to remember uh, because he died. We should remember that McNair was able to play the saxophone and saw 